Hi, I'm Ernie Panicoli. I'm a photographer from New Jersey, and I'm here with Mark, and we are recording for Future Topic. We live in the studio at futuretopic.com, interviewing a legend. When I say a legend, a real legend. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Ernie talking about his past, present, and his new book called Hip Hop and the End of the World. For those of you that don't know, in a career spanning over 40 years, Ernie, aka Brother Ernie, has one of the largest photo collections spanning from the birth of hip hop right up until now. Brother Ernie, in 1973, picked up his first camera and have never put it down since. Brother Ernie is a true Native American and full activist. Brother Ernie, welcome to Future Topic. Here's the first question. What was the model and make of your first camera, and how did you get it? First camera was a Canon A1, <clears throat> and I actually borrowed it from uh, my girlfriend, uh, and um, that was my first camera. How old were you, and when did this sudden love for photography first begin? Uh, I was probably 23, and... Um, I actually had a disdain for photography because I was a painter and I saw painting as valid and photography as invalid. So um, I picked up the camera because I wanted to photograph the emerging graffiti that was all over my community. But um, I actually was amazed that Picking up a camera, I already knew about lighting composition, uh, portraiture, you know, it was automatic because I had spent years and years training as a, as a painter. So picking up a camera was instantaneous. I knew how to express myself with it. Ernie's not just a photographer, he's also an activist. Check out this clip of Brother Ernie on TV getting down to the real nitty gritty of American politics. You want to send people back that are not from here. The Red Man is the original inhabitant of this country. No, let me finish. It was a land that was stolen from a Red Man, made prosperous by the sweat and slave labor of black men, and now you want to send everybody back or separate everybody and keep your people into, you know, some kind of uh, heaven. Now, my question, wait, my question is very, very basic. If you want to send people back, that are not indigenous to this continent. Are you going to start with the whites? The word Indian is another racist word like Negro or the other word. It's stupid. They shouldn't what use the original Indian. word was is now lost to history. You came like from Columbus, Mongolia, Mongoloids. That's alleged. What well, we have history that from? predates the whites in, Mon in Mongolia and all that, the Aryans, your so-called people. Let me run this by you very slowly. Columbus came here and was so impressed by the sincerity, warmth, and decency that he received that he called, and this is from white scholars in Europe, in Turin, who told Russell Means that they were originally, the original people that he met here were called in Dios, which in Spanish means in God or with God. He was so taken. The Europeans of which your, your stock... Your photography is not necessarily all hip-hop. We've seen photos of actors and other famous faces too. How did you get so into taking photos of hip-hop legends? I mean, what is your exact connection with hip-hop? As not many people know, well, first, let me be immodest and say I'm a hip-hop legend. I'm in the Hip Hop Hall of Fame since 2014. I was the spokesman, the keynote speaker at the United Nations for the Temple of Hip Hop. And I am the Supreme Minister of Culture for the Universal Zulu Nation. So I go very deep into hip hop, both as a documenter, as an influencer, and as a role model of how to document a culture um, but I'm more than a hip-hop photographer I'm also an activist and I've also documented people like the Dalai Lama and Johnny Depp and uh, just you know endless 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 amounts of people around the globe and I've done shows in the UK I've done shows in France I've done uh, shows in South America, in California, and Canada. And in Canada, as a native brother, I have a huge 
uh, extended family in hip hop and beyond. So that's a little bit about you know me and my life and my credentials. There's a lot of people out there who call themselves photographers, taking the worst photos that you could ever imagine, adjusting the images on software to cheat or lie. How different is your approach? And does the likes of Photoshop appeal to you? I think the difference between me and many of the new generation or so-called alleged photographers is that they will take 100 pictures to get that one salient, powerful image. Me, I look because when I began it was film and it was expensive to buy the film, put it in the camera, have it printed up. It was expensive, so you had to be economical. So what I would always do then and now is look at a person 100 ways and take one photograph. And that made me learn timing because in photography and portraiture and and anything, one second before, one second after you've lost it, it's getting that one magic moment, that one rhythmic spiritual connection, that, that iconic image that makes it powerful. So that's the difference between me and them. As far as Photoshop goes, Photoshop has been a blessing because you can convert color images into black and white easily. You can uh, salvage older scratched pictures. You can restore images that have been scratched or, or deteriorated. So it's a blessing and it's a beautiful time, but you must use it as a tool and not as a crutch. So Ernie, in your view, what makes a photographer a real photographer? Wow, what makes a photographer a real photographer? I'll put it into a political racial context. As a child growing up, the only time you saw people of color in the media, on television, or in the newspapers or magazines was in handcuffs on the six o'clock news as you know, as negative an image as you could possibly get. And I made a vow when I picked up a camera that I would take anyone that I photographed to make them look iconic, bigger than life, powerful and spiritual. That's the difference between me and that's what makes me a real photographer. And that's why my work has resonated around the world and through all kinds of cultural upheavals. Now, Ernie, we know there might be many, but if you were to narrow it down to the best five, what would be your most and precious value photo or photos that you've ever taken? I have to quote Pablo Picasso. They asked him his favorite painting, and without even thinking and without any irony in his voice, he said the next one. However, there are those moments in my career that stood out, that resonated meeting Gil Scott Heron, sitting in a Jeep with Biggie Smalls. Uh, once I was walking down the street in Midtown Manhattan with Nas and clouds came by and they looked like an eagle. And I asked him, I said, Nas, do you see that? He said, yes. He looked up, he said, that's an eagle. And he imitated that eagle. And I have a picture of him and that cloud structure uh, standing around uh, with Lauren Hill and seeing how beautiful she was at that time and how pensive and meditative and I captured those images and there were many people that are no longer with us whether it's Tupac or Biggie or uh, uh, Prodigy or so many brothers and sisters leave us so early and I look back at those pictures and they have a special resonation with me and I, I think of, you know, young people, man, in their 20s and 30s, taken out from drugs or guns or, or jealousy, and, um, you know, just bad health, uh, a thousand things. I remember uh, uh, Heavy D and I were communicating on the uh, social media and we agreed to have lunch. And sure enough, he went to England came back on the plane, got a blood clot and died. And I never got a chance to have that final uh, dinner with him. I remember James Baldwin, the Arthur, calling me and me calling him and we promised that I'd get together for lunch. 
and both of our schedules were so terrible he went to France and never came back so there are those images and those people and those iconic moments even working with John Kennedy Jr. the, the president of the United States Sun we worked together for 13 weeks on a project for public broadcast and you know he went up in a plane and didn't come back so I look at those pictures and they resonate with me and they, they cause me pain but they also make me understand that life is temporary and you have to do everything that you can for everyone that you can and you have to excel you have to be the best you you can be while you're here because nobody is guaranteed long life nobody is guaranteed tomorrow and if you wait till tomorrow tomorrow might not get here so each day you have to get up and say thank you and make today a powerful beautiful spiritual connected you know day that makes a difference make it you know if, if you had one day to live if you had 24 hours to live what would you do think about that okay brother ernie you just wrote and released a brand new book called hip-hop at the end of the world tell us a little bit about it and what exactly prompted you to do this book um <clears throat> i had and have so many images i have something like more than a half a million images of hip-hop between graffiti and the djs and the mcs and the b-boys and all the fashion and uh, style and the politics I, i i could do easily 10 books right now and i wanted to do that book and through a whole series of events i was contacted by rizzoli books and they offered me a book deal but not only did they offer me a book deal and and promise to make a book but they promised to make a beautiful powerful spiritual book and people around the world are writing me and telling me that my book is a hip-hop bible and it's selling really well around the world and to me that's a great honor to be called a hip-hop bible i mean you know his public enemy you could turn to another page and see ice tea you could turn to another page and see you know a young nas you know every single picture in there we spent hours and days selecting and we started with something like 5,000 pictures and we finally broke it down to 250 images and it covers the entire spectrum of hip-hop and it's a beautiful book it's well produced and it's well written and it's articulate and it is also fun to read and it's fun to watch when these people were young and how you know people now have tattoos on their faces and the anal cavities and so you know it's it's just it was a different time and i'm very proud and very glad to have done that book now with all the photography shoots and sessions that you've ever done which individuals were the most awkward or complete pain in the asses to work with. <laughs> um, I don't know if you realize, or I don't know if the audience realizes my size. I'm a big man. I'm over six foot. I weigh 265 pounds. I don't know how that translates into stone. I also have a, I, I've been told, I don't believe it, but I've been told that I have an aura around me that says be careful around him okay and uh, I say all that because hip-hop and hip-hop photography is a very uh, masculine very macho type thing and a lot of times being where I'm from you know you, you learn how to have that look And you learn not to smile. You learn to look like you have a gun in one hand and, and, a, and, a, and a box cutter in the other. And that's a survival technique. So I carried that into the studio. I carried that into my persona. So no matter where I went and no matter who I dealt with, even gangbangers and Wu-Tangs and, you know, I just had to... Plus, you know, I've studied martial arts since I was nine years old. So I, I carry a certain... I guess what white folks would call gravitas. And I very seldom, if ever, had a problem with anyone. 
And most people were grateful that I took the time and energy and they knew my track record and they knew my energy and they knew that anything that I did with them would help them sell records or, or tickets or, or books or whatever. So I've never had a problem. The only person I ever had a problem with was a really manly looking woman named Deborah Cox, whose career, thankfully now, uh, as Biggie said, her reign on the top was short like leprechauns. All right, she's history now. But she was terrible and she was obnoxious and uh, I was doing everything I could to make this very manly woman look like a woman, but she looked more like a, a, a bouncer. And uh, she was terrible, and she she sticks in my mind. But other than that, in 40 plus years, one bad egg, I don't think that's a bad track record. There's a footnote to the Deborah Cox story. A week later, Naughty by Nature invited me to a record release or something. And I'm backstage with Naughty by Nature, a group that I, I love, I've worked with forever. And, you know, they were at the peak of their their, their, their glory, their gl glamour. And I'm backstage with them. And Deborah Cox works in. And I don't know what happened, but Tretch and Vinny, they say, hey, Deborah, you got to meet Ernie. Ernie's a wonderful person. Ernie is true hip hop. And, and they started heaping praise on me and uh, coming over and giving me a hug. And they said, you need to meet her. So I went up and shook her hand and, and they just kept telling her all my credentials. And I know how uncomfortable that must have been for her because she had just been a total shit. Or as you say in the UK, a total shite in the studio and here she is with this major group giving me props so i know that must have been uncomfortable deborah if you're listening be nice to people your career is over you weren't a star then you're not a star now just be nice it doesn't hurt a smile is a beautiful thing to share and if somebody takes the time and is trying to make you look beautiful don't rag them and i'm not a groupie or a fan i don't need that peace tell us a little bit about your first book called Who Shot Ya? This is my first book, Who Shot You? It came out in 2002. It was done by Harper Collins, and it was the absolute first book, the first book on hip hop photography by a hip hop photographer who was from and of the culture. And in the book, we have uh, his sister Soulja, and different people. It's an excellent book. Unfortunately, now the book is out of print and it's a collector's item, but it uh, here's, here's Nas when he was very young. Um, Flavor Flav, who is not my son. Um, it was the first book done by a person from the culture itself, and it was the first real photography book on hip-hop and i remember when i showed it to nas nas handed it back to me after scouring it for like 20 minutes he said brother ernie this this is not a book <laughs> he had all his friends with him and they were drinking hennessy so i said what he said it's not a book so i said of course it's a book he said no he said it's not a book he said it's a hip hop yearbook. <laughs> it's like a high school yearbook. So I'll never forget that. And it was hysterical. And um, it was my first book and I did a magnificent book tour. And I waited, that was in 2002. I waited 17 years to do a second book. And the second book is called Hip Hop at the End of the World. A lot has changed, a lot has stayed the same, but I've documented four decades of hip hop photography and hip hop changes, hip hop fashion, hip hop dance, and hip hop politics. And no other man on the earth has done that. Now, Ernie, what is your take on the situation in regards to Ben Barta and the accusations placed upon him? I understand that you guys were pretty close friends. How did this affect you? Certain charges have been made against the brother. I have known, and, and this is this is the most personal and the most up close answer you're ever going to get about Africa Bambata. And I don't lie. I don't sugarcoat anything. I don't. I don't protect anybody. The truth is the truth. I've known the brother for 35 years. I have seen time after time after time 
whether it was KRS-One in the X-Clan or brothers from the West Coast and the East Coast, I've seen time and time again where he has called us together and put out the word that before we are East Coast or West Coast or this or that, we're black men or we're all black men and we're all from Africa and we're all brothers and sisters. That's rule number one. I've seen him save lives. I've seen him devote and dedicate his life to teaching and uplifting. I have never seen and I've traveled and I've been as close to him as I've been to any man on this earth other than my children. Um, I have never seen or detected anything irregular or improper or loathsome from the man. That's my personal take on it. And as far as the charges against him, they were made by some very, very weak, psychologically weak, psychologically damaged people. And the internet instantly, for all the times, the hundreds of times he saved lives, the internet didn't light up. But these charges instantly spread all over the world. And if you look in the context of black leaders and leaders of color, you will see every single one of them. Dr. Martin Luther King was killed. Malcolm was killed. Every single one. Huey Newton was killed. Every single leader was either disparaged, disgraced. They used every technique and trick in the book. Bill Cosby who spent his whole life making positive imagery is in prison on some charges that may or may not be real. I don't know. I've only met the man once. I don't really know anything about him. But I forgot Van Bader. I'll put my word on. And now the same people, specifically Sabneta, two words, S-A space N-E-T-A, who did all these terrible videos about it, now is on the internet apologizing to him and saying that the people, one of the people that had pressed charges or, or had made disparaging remarks about Africa Bambata, now has been revealed to be an agent. In the United States, we have something called COINTELPRO, which is counterintelligence program, which work to defame our leaders and destroy our relationships with organizations. And in the United States, every organization, whether it's the Black Panthers or uh, you know Black Lives Matter or any the Nation of Islam, uh, Minister Farrakhan, all of these organizations have been attacked constantly by the media. Either they call them anti-Semites or a gang or this or that. The, the Universal Zulu Nation has been called a gang since its inception. We are not a gang. We are a fraternal organization of people, brothers and sisters from around the world. Race, we have white, black, brown, Asian, and red. We have, it, it's the only organization that's lasted 45 years and has been worldwide in 50 countries. And no one has ever been put out of the Zulu nation or denied entrance because of their race, their, their, their gender, their, their sexual preference, nobody. That is forbidden. We are a universal organization and we recognize the humanity of all people. And we must show respect to our elders and to our females. Okay, and there's a certain way we're supposed to greet each other. How you're supposed to greet the female, how you're supposed to greet the male, how you're supposed to conduct yourself. And in 45 years, no one has ever come out and made charge against anyone in the organization for anything. This happened at the, the onset of the Trump administration. I personally know the man. I do not believe the charges. I love the brother. And even if I love him, if I thought that he was wrong, I would address it because I am a father. I have three grandchildren and I have spent my life educating, lifting and protecting children. And if I thought for one second any of these charges were true, I would be the first to be out there and to disassociate myself from both him and the Universal Zulu Nation. I do not believe the charges because they are out of character with his character and with the beautiful, almost saintly, divinely inspired brother that I know. How do you go from being in the black spades and 
gangbanging and shooting people and stabbing people in the South Bronx to getting a divine message to organize people and to make us one in coherent family. How does that happen? That has to be divinely inspired. That's my take. You may find problems with it, you may have problems with me, but that's from my heart and my soul. If I'm wrong, time will prove me wrong. But that's from my heart and my soul, and that's from my essence. Peace. So there you have it, the interview live with Brother Ernie on FutureTopic.com. Thank you for listening and thank you for watching. Have a great day.